Welcome to NAG for Summaries. My name is Eric Hemingway and I will be your faculty for this training on NAG for Summaries. Um, but I wanna put a disclaimer before we start that the NAG for Summaries regulations could be subject to change and we'll advise you to please check in uh, at the National NAG for website to have the most up-to-date information regarding the regulations that pertain to summaries. For this training module, we will look at one of the most important aspects of the NAGPRA process, and that is the summaries. Uh, the summaries is part of the NAGPRA law, the Native American Grades Protection and Repatriation Act, which was passed in 1990. This law focuses on the return of Native American human remains, cultural items, and the protection of Native American burial sites. The learning objectives for this training module will be well, what is a summary and who must compile one? What is the legal definition of categories under a summary? And why is a summary necessary under the law? What is a NAG for summary? Federal agencies and institutions that fall under the category of a museum under the law have to compile a list, summary list of items that fall under the categories of sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony, and unassociated funerary objects. While the categories of a summary are defined, it is often uncertain what specific items fall under these categories. So this module will help you determine what should be listed on a summary, where the summaries are distributed, and the legal mandates associated with a summary. On the legal definitions of what a summary is, you can find these within the regulations of the law. And I've been to numerous trainings, and I'm, I know it can be kind of dry if somebody just reads you these regs. So this is just a, the regs themselves and you can look them up at your leisure um, on the National NAGPRA website. So in my time doing NAGPRA and working for a federally recognized tribe and going through this process, it was very clear that summaries are essential to having repatriations occur, but they're, they're a list, but they're very different from the list that we talked about in the previous module of inventories. Inventories deal only with Native American human remains and the funerary objects associated with those remains. And with summaries, it's, it's, a, it's much more broad. It's much more open to interpretation, if you will, and you know, what falls under the category of a sacred object, object of cultural patrimony, and associate, unassociated funerary object. So with this photo here, I chose from the Library of Congress, it's called Indian Basket Maker at Mackinac Island, very close to my home. And in this image, circa 1890 to 1910, it shows Anishinaabe people on Mackinac Island, and they have a large number of objects. These objects that look like black ash baskets, snowshoes, uh, porcupine um, quill work on birch bark. Um, these items are made strictly for sale. They are there to sell their items. They are there to make some revenue, uh, pay some bills. Uh, this is very different than other items we'll be looking at uh, throughout this module of what is a sacred ob object and object of cultural patrimony. Um, not every object that is made by a native individual will fall under these categories of sacred or object of cultural patrimony. Some were made just for sale. And through a consultation process with your tribal constituents and your tribal partners, you'll be able to determine you know, what, when these objects fall under these categories. But I, I really like this image because it shows not just families together, but you know, the handicraft, the, you know, the skill that goes into making these objects, but these objects are specifically used for economic purposes. So what are the legal requirements uh, when it comes to summaries under the law, federal agencies and any institution deemed a museum under NACRA must compile a summary. And these summaries must be completed no later than November 16th, 1993. And a copy of the summary must be sent to National NACRA. So going through your collections as a museum or federal agency, this can be very time consuming in determining you know, what, what is a sacred object for, for these tribes and you know what what would they use and what you know? what's ceremonial, what's sacred. So consultations are really, really important part of this process. Um, going through consultations with uh, museums that I've worked with in the past, uh, we 
the first thing I would do when possible is go to the museum and we will just go through and look at all of their stuff. Um, I, I want to see everything and anything that is remotely native. And so because so many objects fall through the cracks, because a lot of times people who are compiling the summaries um, don't don't know about the ceremonies. They don't know about the culture. They don't know about, you know, these religious practices that these very diverse tribal nations are engaging in. And looking through and just having the ability to just go through drawer by drawer, box by box, it's very time consuming, but so many times I would identify items and say, this should be listed on your summary. You know, these rocks, um, you know, these carvings, these are all part of ceremonies that are still being practiced by tribes to this day. And a lot of, you know, I've seen in, in different instances where a rock will be just labeled a rock and it'll be put in the geology or archeology span collections of that museum. And it would be separated from what they call the ethnographic collections or the Native American cultures. Uh, but I've seen you know, these rocks used in ceremonies personally. And so I was able to use you know, my own personal experience to you know, give testimony and say, that's, that's a sacred object. And so you have to you know, adjust your summary at that point. So, um, so casting the net wide and far and putting your summary together is something that is, I think, very, very much highly recommended because you, you don't know what you don't know. And it's better to put these items that's potential sacred object or object of cultural patrimony and then making the call and saying, I don't think this item is sacred. So that's just some advice of just from doing the work uh, for years uh, with museums and helping them with their summaries. And upon a request from a tribe or NHO Native Hawaiian organization or lineal send it, um, the museum must provide a copy of their summary to that tribe or that individual when they request it. And requesting tribes, NHOs, and lineal tenants shall have access to all the records pertaining to summary collections. And this is really important because a lot of times we will see family names um, on these on these records. Of if an individual sold an item, or if it you know somehow was alienated through a certain family, or if it was taken from a certain town. So all of this information about provenience, family names, tribal names. All of this is really important to determine not just affiliation, but also you know, what this item was and continues to be within tribal communities. And again, consultation is mandatory under the summary process. As you're going through and compiling your summary, consulting with tribes is just, I can't say enough. Even, I, I stress consultation even more with summaries than with inventories. With inventories, it's pretty straightforward with what you're working with with human remains. With summaries, it's, it's much more open to interpretation. So even if you've already compiled your summary and it's been 10, 15, 20 years, it's advisable to go back and, and look at this summary and you know, work with your tribal partners to look at these items one more time. Not everything falls under the Kind of blanket category of eagle feather, drum, pipe. There's a lot of items that are very unique to tribes. And even within you know, a, an area, uh, groups of tribes will use different items made out of different materials, you, you know, with different colors and patterns. So it's, you just can't label one item as sacred and think that it applies to all tribes across the United States. Um, that's just not correct. We're not, uh, we're not a homogeneous people. Of, Know, one culture, one belief system, one language. You know, there's hundreds of different tribes across the United States speaking you know, different languages, living in, living in different environments and having different beliefs uh, and practices. And that has to be accounted for when putting the summaries together is that all these are different. There might be some overlap. Like eagle feathers are used by a lot of different tribes. Um, so are hawk feathers. Uh, drums are used by a lot of different tribes, but there's different types of drums. And also rattles are used, but there's different types of rattles. And you have to account for the, the sovereignty and individuality of tribal nations and how they use these items. So some basics when putting your summaries together, summaries only apply to these very specific categories of sacred, sacred items, objects of cultural patrimony and unassociated funerary objects. Unassociated funerary objects are objects that were with a person upon their, their burial, but have been from and from my experience I've seen a lot of unassociated funerary objects in collections and from my area of the world in the Great Lakes 
uh, these unassociated funerary objects would a lot, be a lot of silver, um, you know, copper kettles, um, certain animal bones were, were often you know, separated from these burials. So this has potential to be a large part of a collection. And a lot of these silver items I've seen, uh, you know, they get teased out or separated. Uh, so if you have this old trade silver from you know, the 16 and 1700s, I, I really examine that again and see, you know, did this come from a burial? You know, um, where did, you know, how do we get this, uh, this silver and so on and so forth. But another big part of summaries is contamination. Uh, you have to check for contamination on summary items in your collections. Uh, many museums and collectors used pretty harsh chemicals in the 20th century to preserve items, um, especially items that were delicate, such as feathers, leather, and painted items. Um, arsenic, strychnine, other, you know, these really harsh chemicals were used. So if you have these older items in your museum, it's very advisable to get them tested immediately. Uh, there's certain organizations and consultants who do this type of testing, and a, a NAGPRA documentation grant can help with offset some of these costs. But it's, it's really important that if you have these items, these older items, especially feathers and leather, uh, if, if you have these items and they're in really good shape and they're pristine and they're 100 years old and they're shiny, that, that's a red flag to me, that this item was treated with something in the past. And once you do find that it has been contaminated, there's a certain process that goes into quarantining this item, uh, moving it away from other items. And you have to let tribal consultants know that this item is contaminated and that we're working through the steps of, you know, making it clean and so on and so forth. So once that's been determined with an item that has to be relayed to any potential tribes affiliated with that item. And some summaries will vary from institution to institution based on what they have. Um, there's no size limit to a summary. It could be 10 items. It could be a, it could be a thousand items. It just depends on your museum. Um, many summaries have large counts due to unassociated furniture objects, which could reach into the hundreds, even thousands, due to you know, small rocks, um, fauna remains, and beads being part of a collection. So I've seen some pretty staggering numbers in terms of summaries, let's say 5,000 items, but it's you know, a large sash of beads that just broke down over time. And there's you know, 500 beads in the sash. So, but that was part of you know, the, the death ritual for that individual. So they counted every individual bead as an associated Fermi object. Just a friendly reminder, uh, summaries do not apply to the Smithsonian. They have their own law uh, when it comes to repatriation and you can go to their, their website if you, um, you know, so choose, but NAGPRA doesn't apply to the Smithsonian, any Smithsonian um, museums. Again, consultation should occur through all phases of the summary process and identifying items. And through that consultation, it is possible to affiliate these items resulting in the repatriation and return of that item to that specific tribe. Uh, documentation, documentation grants can aid in compiling a summary for museums and the Federal Register Notice for summary items are titled Notices of Intent to Repatriate, NIRs. Uh, in my time of doing NAGPRA, which I, I don't practice anymore, I'm in the training phase, um, you know, most of the repatriations I worked on were for NICs, Notices of Inventory Completion for Human Remains. Uh, we, you know, did do a few NIRs, but what, you know, it was, it seemed like it was a much more longer process to have items returned than human remains for a lot of obvious reasons. Um, but it was, it just took an extra level of consultation from my experience to show that this item is sacred. And a lot of times for tribal nations, these items are animate. They have a spirit in them. They are alive and relaying that information to a museum or agency staff, it, it takes some work at times to convey, you know, how that how that is within a tribal community that this item is alive and it needs to come back, and that sometimes these items have to come back to be put to rest. They've they've done their job, they've done their work, um, but they need to be um, put to rest, whether they're burned or buried or set in the woods. But that all depends on the individual tribe and the individual item. Not all items do this. Some items come back and they're reintroduced in the community and they're, they're put back to work, so to speak. And then in some cases, tribes have not used this item for over hundred years. And the knowledge of handling that item, the spirit within that item, you know, the ceremony that's associated with that item is lost over time. 
And I've talked with a few museums. They said, we have these items for this tribe. We're willing to repatriate and affiliate to them. We know it belongs to them, but they're very hesitant about returning this item or items back to their community. And I just gave my opinion on this and said, maybe they're not ready for this item. You know, this item has been out of their community for so long. Who's going to use it? Who's going to handle it? How is it going to be stored? What's the ceremony for it? What is, you know, the language that is associated with it? All this has to be, at times, be reintroduced in the community. And this could take years to figure this out. So that's at the discretion of the tribe. Some tribes just leave items um, at, at a museum until they're ready to have them brought back in their communities where they feel it's safe and ready. Summaries are an item by item list of specific objects with exact counts of these objects. It can be very tedious to put these together, but it's very necessary. Um, so going through the summary process, you know, you got to look at if, if an item has multiple components to it, say a headdress. Uh, you know, headdresses are very common for tribes across North America, but there's different styles of headdresses. It's not always the, the large flowing a plain style headdress. Uh, some headdresses are very small, with just a few feathers, but you got to look at, do I count each individual feather? Or are they all part of this one item of the headdress? So through consultation, um, you'll be able to determine what is the best way to count, you know, something like this that has multiple, multiple facets to it. And description of the summary items are to be included. These descriptions include you know, what kind of materials were used, what colors, what patterns, what is the size of the item, and if appropriate, um, provide photos. Consult with tribes on the sharing of photos of summary items, especially if unassociated family objects are part of the museum's collection. Through the consultation process, say, hey, we have these items. We believe they're unassociated funerary objects. And do you feel comfortable receiving photos for these? Or we can just describe them to you. Um, it's because some tribes may not feel comfortable receiving a, an image of a burial object. But for these other items or the other descriptions, colors and patterns are, are, are really, really important. Uh, these patterns are often stories that depict people, events, uh, you know, pieces of history for a tribe. Uh, a lot of times they're, you know, associated with specific colors and certain directions. So, you know, all the, the very finite um, details have to, should be provided. And this will give more uh, clues into what this item is for your, your tribal consultants. And for us, you know, we're really, we utilize geometrics a lot. So when they see a lot of geometrics on these items, you know, we had more interest, like, okay, this has a stronger possibility of being Odawa. A lot of tribes use geometrics, so I'm not saying that we're the exclusive, but we, you know, when I seen this, it was, you know, we want to take it a step further. And especially, you know, certain colors. There's a lot of colors that across the board are sacred for tribes, such as red and blue, um, but it's the pattern and how they're used, too. So all of this is, is telling stories, and so provide this when requested upon by a tribe. In the acquisition history of items is to be included as part of the complete summary of uh, the base of who collected, when they collected, how they acquired the items, and where they collect is all really important information. If the information is available, if you don't have it, you don't have it. But if you do have it, certain collectors operated in certain areas, they were operated primarily with certain tribes, they were looking at specific items, some collectors were very big. Um, the sacred items, some collectors were more, you know, focused on unassociated funerary objects, and they start to build this pattern within their collecting history. That can be really important and determine these items that often these collectors operated with multiple museums. And then I also, from my experience in the early 20th century, there was a lot of trading going on between museums and collectors, very loose. So a museum might have one item, then they trade it with another, but it's all from this one collector. So all of this history can really you know, fill in the blanks of determining what it is and what tribe that has the strongest affiliation. And I can't stress this enough, religious and cultural practices vary from tribe to tribe, making consultation a vital step in compiling a summary. Items such as rocks, feathers, and pieces of wood might be considered cultural items um, used by certain tribes on all possible items in a collection during consultation. Again, we're not all homogeneous people. We don't all have the same practices. We don't all use the same items. Um, even if we use a very similar item, it might be used in a different fashion from tribe to tribe. 
So again, I come to the example of pipes and pipes are used by numerous tribes. And many of these pipes are made out of catlinite or pipestone. Uh, tribes, from, tribes from the West, tribes from the East, uh, utilize a catlinite or pipestone to make these sacred objects, but how they're used within that tribe varies from tribe to tribe. And some, some pipes aren't made out of pipestone. I've seen black pipes, I've seen green pipes, I've seen you know, like gray pipes, different stones. Uh, again, that varies from tribe to tribe. And also something that is used quite a bit are raptor feathers. And whether it's eagle, hawk, osprey, or even owls, you know, raptor feathers I see are used in a lot of different ways for different tribes, but it's specific to that tribe. And then you know, through my, my work um, under NAGPRA, I had the good fortune to go out west and up into Alaska, and then the raven is, is very prominent in the cultures there. Not so much in, in, you know, where I'm at in the Great Lakes. So, you know, you have to consult with each individual tribe to figure out, you know, what is important to them and how they use it. So sources tribes may utilize and provide information regarding cultural items are, you know, your religious leaders, talk to the tribal people who are still practicing, um, elders you know, who are within these communities, cultural events, um, native languages, uh, the landscapes will often tell stories or be connected to certain objects. And also the continuing practice of certain ceremonies in the community. This is still going on for a lot of us, but also a lot of these ceremonies have been taken apart or dismantled or extracted out of communities. And part of that extraction has been this ongoing process of what we call the civilization um, laws and policies created by the federal government. So the federal government had a you know, very concentrated effort to make us not native. And through these laws and policies and actions, uh, a lot of these ceremonies and these items were literally taken out of communities. And some of these have been out of communities for well over a century. Um, tribes have, have bounced back, were resilient, um, but relearning these ceremonies takes time. So it can't be expected that if you have this item, a tribe will know exactly everything about it, the language that goes with it, the ceremonies, the spirits. Um, that's not always the case. Some cases it's true, but in, in some items that's just not gonna be there. And it's, it takes time for tribes to you know, build that knowledge base back up and then decide whether they're gonna pursue the item or not. And for some tribes, these items are you know, very powerful and you have to have the right environment to bring them back. So this all goes in with the consultation process. And also you know, the tribes will determine how much information to share with an, you know, a museum or agency to help bring this item into a re, you know, process of repatriation. Uh, so this is something that is decided upon within each tribe and tribal individuals. Is how much do we give? How much do we share um, with this museum or agency? Uh, this is many times very culturally sensitive information. It's sacred information. And a lot of this information can only be shared in certain ways at certain times of years. Um, so there's a lot that goes into uh, even just discussing some of these objects. So this is all part of things that uh, come out during consultation. And so I really stress the patience uh, to work with tribal communities on going through the process. Again, some items are utilized by many tribes across the United States. Like eagle feathers are probably one of the most prominent items used from coast to coast. Crumbs, pipes, pipes and rattles are utilized by many tribes. Um, if no provenience, you know, no tribal name, uh, no provenience provided at all with the items, it is advisable to send a summary to all tribes. So for example, you have a catlinite pipe, a redstone pipe, nothing's with it. You have no name, no provenience, no tribe, it's just you got the pipe. And compiling your summary, it's obviously something that's you know high priority, a sacred item. Um, I would send the summary just to every tribe across the United States and just cover your bases. And, and see who responds because within that pipe, there may be some details that you're not seeing that may help lead to you know, further information. Maybe a, a certain design, maybe a certain scheme of colors, or if there's a, a stem with it, you know, maybe there's some type of you know, des design or patterns that will help you know, tell the story. So I've seen summaries that go out to every single tribe and it's 90% it's of the time it's, it's pipes and feathers. They have these items, they know they're used by a lot of tribes and they just send 
the summary to everybody with hopes that somebody's going to respond back. So this is an image from the Library of Congress. And I was debating on whether they use this image or not, but um, I think there's some, some learning that can be from, gained from this. And the name of the image is Old Indian Witch Doctor, spinning a thread on bare knees on the Skeena River. Um, and I didn't want to use this image because it has this label of Old Witch Doctor. Um, but I, I'm using it because I want to show how the description of you know healers and medicine people and religious practitioners for tribes has been miscued over the years. That you know the people who do these ceremonies for us have often been labeled witches and shamans, and you know these are Western terms, often derogatory. Um, so if you're going through and doing your own research on you know items, you know what's used by a tribe, you're, you're going to run into things like this. And I just want to bring awareness of that this isn't. You know, many times how we label ourselves, we don't label ourselves witches. Uh, this is something that's been you know, labeled, put upon us. But within this um, photo, you know, he has some, some items that are sacred to his community. He has this drum and then behind him is this, this really large totem pole. And this is very indicative for West Coast tribes all the way from you know, Washington state all the way up to Alaska. Those are the totem pole cultures. Those are the tribes that utilize these types of totem poles, but totem poles have become this almost pop culture item in the 20th century where you see them outside of restaurants, you see them at um, camps for kids, and it just become this really generic item uh, within you know, America, but and the reality is they're very sacred for these tribes, and this is a real totem pole, and sometimes tribes you know, will go and repatriate these totem poles. So you got to realize that even though you've been seeing this, you know, through the eyes of Americana and pop culture for decades, that's that's not the true identity of, of a totem pole. We have them here in my own my own state at, at restaurants and outside of businesses that are, that are owned by non-native people, and it's just something to it's a draw. And I, I have a lot of umbrage with this. It's like we're not totem pole people here, and you're just appropriating, you know, this this thing to you know sell business at, at your business and so um you got to look at these a little bit closer um, but also when you're going through your own research and and looking at you know tribal customs and populations this type of language will pop up but you got to move past it so collection history providing a collection history of cultural materials is to a request and tribe is required under the law Helpful pieces of collection information include receipts, ledgers, notes, publications, accession records, photos, maps, correspondence, and names of collectors. Again, collectors can often be cross-referenced with other museums with whom the collector worked with in the past. It's happened a lot, in, like I said, in the early 20th century. Uh, I made um, sort of a career on following one collector in the Great Lakes. He operated in over 20 different museums in the Midwest. He was selling, he was trading, bartering, and at the end of the day, his main collection went to one museum. And that museum was pretty hard up for funds in the 1940s. And they decided to sell the lion's share of this guy's collection. And it went to all these different museums. It was, it was <laughs> I've never seen a story like it where they would just have basically a yard sale for, for all these items. And, but at the sale, there was ledgers, who bought what and where did, where did it go? So this, you know, I followed this guy through the paper trails for years. And some of these items we were able to repatriate back as sacred objects, primarily eagle feathers. But the eagle feathers are very specific at being from the tribe that I work for. So through the collector's history, we were able to get some of the items back in wooden bowls. Uh, wooden bowls was another big item for us. They were used in ceremonies, there's utilitarian bowls, and then there were sacred bowls. So a lot of times these items will be um, differentiated from the utilitarian with how, you know, certain carvings of animals and spirits and designs. So how ornate they are, what kind of material that they're made out of uh, would help determine, you know, was this a sacred bowl or not? And the labeling of items from early collections is very important to note. Terms used to describe sacred objects often include witchcraft, magic, pagan, mythology, cult, trinket, and curiosity. Uh, it took me, I have, 
obviously some issues with this language, but once I worked through my issues, I was able to use this as a tool. If they're labeling these items as such, in my mind, I was interpreting this as um, sacred, as object of cultural patrimony. And so this is, this is the, the, the wording of the day of the 19th and 20th century. Um, but so if you see these words, it's, it's, a, it's a clue to what they are. More about collection history, the fact that Native American cultural items were part of a large widespread market across the United States um, is very important that it has to be taken into account that there was just this widespread selling, um, taking, and also at this time there was this demonization of Native religion and beliefs. So there was this, again, this press to quote unquote civilize us. And that, you know, a lot of people were giving weight, giving their items up, or a lot of these items were acquired under some pretty extreme duress, uh, that a lot of items were being destroyed, they were being burned, and also that some of these items were being collected while tribes were um, being, I, I would call it, you know, held hostage on certain areas of land where they couldn't leave. And uh, one case that I heard that this collector knew that this tribe couldn't leave this area and they're under guard by the army. And this collector just kept going back to try to buy items from the tribal people there and they refused to sell. But over time they broke down because they needed money for food. Um, so he just kept grinding on this community and acquiring items until he collected you know, a very vast amount of items. And that's how he got his collection. So there's some very unethical practices that have gone on with collecting sacred items and items or objects of cultural patrimony over time. So it's really important to understand the historical context of how these items have been alienated. It wasn't always a simple giving or selling. Um, there's it's a lot of complexity on how items were being um, moved within communities. Within my own community here during the 1800s, there was a large um, movement to destroy items from the church. So they would go through and they would demand that the tribe would burn items publicly to show that they're committed to the Christian faith. Um, some people did this, but some people also hid items or the items just moved out of the community uh, out of fear of just being destroyed. So there's a lot of moving parts into the stories of how items are alienated out of communities. And it wasn't until 1978 that Native Americans in the United States had the religious rights recognized with the passage of the Indian Religious Freedom Act. Until that time, a great many items were alienated from the tribal community due to social, religious, and government pressure. So the fact that we have to have our own law to openly practice religion in this country, I think is a very important piece of information when compiling the story of sacred objects under some reason for, for NAGPRA. And this is a definition of an unassociated for any object under the law. Again, unassociated for any object vary widely from tribe to tribe. Rocks, pieces of wood, fauna remains are often items put with the dead. Some post-contact and you know, after contact with Europeans and Americans, we started to see in my community and in the Great Lakes, you know, knives, kettles, you know, pieces of gun, you know, guns, uh, jewelry, and crucifixes, you know, started to see quite a bit of as were um, burial items. So consult with your tribes and get a game plan of what is funerary objects for that tribe. And I would, you know, recommend just having an ongoing list for the tribes that you consult with. And just keep that list handy. And then as you go through your collections and start checking off the list, you know, does this tribe, do we have any items that pertain to this tribe or this tribe? Oh, we see some, you know, cross reference here for this one item for multiple tribes. So just having that list uh, ready. So as you go through your collections is, is really helpful. And once items are connected with the tribe and or tribes, there may be cultural protocols that tribes want to be in place for these items. So once you figure out, okay, this is an unassociated funerary object, it's probably linked to this tribe or tribes, you know, contact the tribe and figure out what's my best method of, of storing this item. Is there certain colors of cloth that it needs to be wrapped in? Does it need to be put away from other items? Um, do you, the tribes want what we call certain medicines, uh, like tobacco or, or sage or sweetgrass, or it depends on the tribe. You know, do they want these placed with that item until it's time for them to come home? Um, you know, the storage and handling of these items is really important. 
And so this is from this image here is from a pretty famous collection of portraits from the McKinney and Hall portraits in the 19th century. And it's called the Chippewa Widow. She was a Ojibwe widow seated on a rock holding a bundle of clothing and other personal effects belonging to her former husband. Um, it's a very, um, very powerful image. I use this quite a bit. And this is a mourning bundle. Uh, so this is something that was used by different tribes, obviously the Ojibwe or Chippewa. Um, when somebody passes, they would have these mourning bundles and they would you know, hold on to them for quite some time, sometimes up to a year. And in this case, it looks like it was from her husband. So she has her husband's you know, clothing items. And I've seen this with children, um, parents. So uh, it depends from tribe to tribe. And this is a very unique item. It's obviously a sacred item, and, but some tribes might consider it an unassociated fairy object. It depends on their belief, but without a doubt, it would fall into the category of either a sacred object or unassociated fairy object in my mind. And this is all cloth. So you may have these old tattered pieces of cloth or you know, that's put into this bundle like a small doll. And you might think well, this is a toy or something for a young kid. Um, that probably might not be the case. It, it could be one of these burial bundles. Uh, mourning bundles. So it's something, again, you have to consult with with your tribes. Even the simple bundle of cloth could be something that you don't think of. And here is the definition of sacred objects under the law. And the tribes determine who their religious leaders are. Um, this isn't determined by the museums or the federal agencies, and they determine the practices. Uh, this isn't done by the museum or the agencies. And these objects, again, vary widely from tribe to tribe based on their practices and their belief systems. It's important to note that Native Americans are not, again, homogeneous across the United States. Uh, so I, I keep stressing this over and over, but um, this is something, a stereotype I run into over and over, um, not just in the, the world of NAGPRA, but in my world of historical interpretation and, and doing public history that, you know, we're lumped into this one group, but that's not the case. Consultation with tribes to determine what items are sacred occur as soon as a museum or agency has questions or uncertainty. So as soon as you get that question, contact your tribal consultants and ask the question. That's, that's what tribal um, leaders, religious leaders, NAGPRA designees are there for. Even if a museum or agency has labeled an item or group of items under a certain summary category, the museum or agency should still consult with the appropriate tribe on such items. It could shift. You know, a museum may have initially labeled this as a sacred object, but through consultation, no, this is an unassociated funerary object, and you change the category, you change what, what it falls under, and you amend your summary. This happens quite often. Along with consultation, written sources can help guide a museum or agency as to what items have the potential to be sacred. Uh, these sources include, but not limited to, um, anthropology reports, books, articles, tribal websites, reputable books on tribes' history and communities, and publish federal register notices. So if you don't have that team built of tribal consultants yet, you know, you can still do your own homework and start to piece together, you know, the possibility of these items falling under these categories. And something I would really stress again are these federal register notices and see what people are repatriating. What, what, what has fallen under these categories of sacred object and object of cultural patrimony? And then see what tribes are, are you know, they're working with. So again, these federal register notices are great uh, pieces of information that can be utilized in a lot of different ways. There's a definition of the object of cultural patrimony. And as with sacred objects, object, objects of cultural patrimony um, vary from tribe to tribe, making consultation very important for these items to go back. So um, personally, I've seen a lot of these items fall under both categories of sacred object and object of cultural patrimony. Um, the big difference is these objects of cultural patrimony um, are more community property. They get passed down from individual to individual and they stay within the community. Range of items, tribes have repatriate under this category is very wide from a community. I've seen community Bibles be repatriated, tribes uh, to sacred dowels. So it, again, you, you can't think that it's one or the other. Now, I was really surprised this one tribe I was um, consulting with and 
one of the first objects they repatriated in the law was a very large Bible. It's huge. And they were a removed tribe from the East Coast and they ended up in the Great Lakes. And this was part of their story. And this is something they carried with them for well over a century was this large Bible. It had family names in it and it was part of their religion at that point. And they repatriated it and they got it back. So um, something I wasn't expecting, but that's their right. And that's, you know, their prerogative. And then also these sacred dowels that, you know, I would have no idea about and talking with the tribal leaders they're like these are objects of cultural patrimony within our tribe we don't and for my tribe don't use them as much but for some tribes they're very important again consult with your tribes in some cases they fall under both categories so this picture again from the library of congress is labeled the war dance of chippewas or ojibwes shows chippewa native american seated and standing at a gathering with a drum in the foreground so I really like this image because it shows the drum as to me as the prominent item. It, it's right there. And this drum is a sacred object. I've seen drums very similar to this used in ceremonies personally um, in the Great Lakes. So just by the way the, the drum is made, the stand, the feathers, everything about it says sacred object to me, but also object of cultural patrimony because many times these drums are passed down to people within that community and many times within the same family. They're called drum keepers. Uh, that's their responsibility. And if it doesn't stay within the family, the drum will go to somebody else within the community. And they take the responsibility of taking care of the drum and so on and so forth. And having, you know, there's large dances and ceremonies associated with that specific drum. And I really like this photo also because it shows the shift in, in clothing. Uh, it's 1907. So it's you know, brimmed hats, vests, trousers, uh, dresses by the women, very American, very Western style dress, but still practicing the ceremony, still using the drum. So even though they're in American style dress, they are still practicing their culture, their religion, their spirituality with this item. So this is a, you know, a photo that, you know, I would use in helping if I was starting out my summary process, um, like what, what, what am I looking at? You know, what, what is being um, used by these communities? And you can just tell by how ornate the drum is. It, it's, it's, it's got a certain look to it and you can just tell it's special. It's not your, your average drum. And these are all clues to it being sacred. So again, we talked about it throughout all the training modules, including this one consultation is a requirement when compiling a summary. So here's just some of the uh, regulations about consultation. I'm going to look at where the item is from, what lands. Um, so again, throughout the entire process from day one to the very end, consult, consult, consult. You can't consult enough, especially when dealing with items that fall under summaries. Summary consultation begins with the summary being sent out. That's not the end of it. Um, to be advised, we follow up with a phone call, an email, and some face-to-face -face dialogue when appropriate with the appropriate tribal official. Back to the Library of Congress. So this photo is from 1855 to 1865, pretty early, um, called Chief Crane Potawatomi holding Tomahawk, an unidentified Native American man in delegation, in delegation to Washington, DC. So this photo, I'm looking at and seeing, you know, this is a Potawatomi style headdress. The guy who's standing, very different from the plain style of a Rickaro and Lakota and Cheyenne and so forth. Um, so I would look at what types of feathers are on this headdress. Are they eagle? Are they woodpecker? Um, are they hawk? Maybe it's a combination of all of them, but he's wearing this headdress and it's a delegation to Washington. So it's, it's got some prominence. And they also are showing the tomahawk, but it's a tomahawk pipe. And so this is an item that I've seen some tribes label as a sacred object or object of cultural patrimony, it depends on the tribe. So when this pipe is associated with the tomahawk, it, it can change the nature of the item. It's not just strictly a weapon. You know, it could be used in ceremony with the pipe. So again, through consultation, you determine you know, what if this falls under a summary category. And then the clothing. Maybe this clothing has some type of um, ceremonial purpose. I'm not sure. 
but through consultation, you, you can figure this out. And I know some clothing are sacred objects. You know, you have ghost and shirts, you have these wedding dresses. These are sacred objects for, for specific tribes. So don't discredit clothing when putting your summaries together. And some tips for consulting with tribes on summary items. At times, a group of items may constitute what is called a bundle or a medicine bundle. Bundles are often multiple items grouped together as one item with a list of each individual item. So you can have a pipe bundle, a drum bundle. So within, for example, a pipe bundle, you have the pipe, the bowl, the, the piece of rock that makes the pipe, then you have the stem, then you have the pipe cleaner, then you have the pipe bag, and any type of medicines um, that are used in the ceremony. So all this together may constitute one bundle, but you have to list out everything within the bundle. So it may come to the museum together, but when you're putting your summary together, you have to list out everything. You just can't simply list, you know, pipe bundle. Um, you have to list everything within that bundle. And cultural items often fall into multiple categories for a tribe, such as war, it could be a funeral death, healing, or causing illness, um, marriage, birth, mourning, and even love medicine. If these details exist within the records at a museum, they need to be related to interested tribes. Some tribes may not request certain items, even if they are affiliated to them based on the original intent of the item. I was consulting with one museum uh, on their collections and they had a, a bundle that said love medicine. And she kind of giggled at it. And I was like, no, this, this could be serious stuff. You don't want to mess, you know, let's keep it under wraps. And, and she goes, what, what exactly is this? I like, well, it's something that, you know, they, they put to make people want them. Um, so she's like, okay, we'll, we'll put this away. Um, and just tell me what to do and say, well, we'll wait. And so, so a lot of these items may have this type of label with them because it, during the sale or trade, this would make it more desirable. And also these items may have not been used for the best intent or purposes. So um, such as causing illness, there's some objects that tribes believe in that you know, um, have a negative effect on communities and people, and they may not want them back in their communities. And then there's some items that are used just for war. So that has that type of atmosphere and that energy to it. And tribes may not be ready to bring that item back in their community. So you got to consult because it's not, there's a lot of different dynamics into the different spiritualities and intent of items. For consultation, many tribes believe certain items are alive or are seen as animate and are being infused with spirits. Awareness of this potential belief should be taken in consideration when you're consulting with tribes as part of the belief system. This belief may also impact how tribes request certain items be housed, handled, and care at museums. Some requests may include certain, again, we mentioned this colors, be certain colored cloth to wrap the items in, where they're stored, or even seen. Many tribes I've talked with and have asked that these items not be photographed. And then also um, certain access to the items, not, you know, only certain tribal officials, individuals, or religious leaders would have access or even to handle these items. And these medicines are often um, put with these items. So tobacco is a really uh, prominent medicine that I've seen at museums where they just have bowls of tobacco next to these items. Again, that's at the request of the tribe. And then some tribes have different types of medicines. Some more consultation um, tips in regards to um, summaries. Ask which items are used for cultural practices. No need to ask for details of the ceremony or the cultural practice, only which items are used. So say, is this used for a death ritual? You don't need the whole death, you know, burial ceremony or send off. Just ask, was it used for a, a burial? Was it used for a marriage? Was it used for an adoption? Things of this nature. So you can just at least know, you know, what type of sacredness is associated with it. It is viable to start with tribes in the states of your institution. So if you're in a specific state, um, look for items that are from your state and your tribes. And from my experience, it's always easier to work within than, than start to branch your way out. Uh, get some momentum, you know, had, bring your tribes in, have them consult. And you know, once you get those first couple of repatriations under your belt, it, just, it builds confidence. And you get you know, the process on uh, you know, some experience under the process and it just makes things go much, much smoother. 
tips on consultation. Not all tribes have the same level of cultural and traditional knowledge within the communities. We discussed this earlier um, due to centuries of systematic destruction of tribal communities and their, their knowledge base and their religion. It's just not there for some tribes. For some tribes it is, uh, but for some it just isn't. So we have to, I think, really hold that into account when coming to this consultation process. And there's you know, a lot of well-documented reasons for this. There's this whole issue of boarding schools that tribes have known about since day one, but it's really starting to break nationally about, you know, there's 400 of these institutions of forced assimilation across the United States uh, for well over a century. So these institutions, you know, targeted kids and they're for at young ages are brought into the schools. Some stayed for years and during this whole indoctrination and assimilation process, you know, they, they lose their language, they lose these customs and ceremonies. Uh, and this is by design. So we have to think about that. And then removal, some tribe, you know, dozens of tribes have been removed from their homelands and put into areas that are for all intent purposes, not their home. And so and during this whole removal process, they're alienated from burial grounds, sacred areas, and over decades, centuries, you know, that knowledge is slowly dwindled away. Wars and loss of land contribute to, you know, the loss of knowledge pertaining to religion, traditions, and language. So this all, I really strongly, you know, believe has to be taken into account when consultation occurs. That you have to meet tribes where they are. Back to the Library of Congress. Um, this is an image, a photo of an Apache wiki up of, around a structure made out of grass with baskets out in the front. And this is the Edward Curtis photo. I, I, I don't try to use Curtis's stuff too much, but with this image, I felt okay because it shows these baskets. And these baskets have some very specific designs. And again, I, I'm coming back to that, um, that identity that, that these items are telling stories through design. And you really have to look closely and even if you don't know what you're looking at, you, you know you're looking at a specific design and it's label, it's affiliated you know, with this tribe, Apache. So if I was starting out and I was putting a summer together and I, I have all these baskets, I would look at you know, something like this and say, okay, we have baskets that are similar with you know, similar shape, um, design, um, size. And I would you know, put these on a summary list of potential sacred objects and send these to these tribes. That's just my advice. So these designs you know, are really, really important, whether it's on a basket, a piece of wood, on a drum, on a piece of clothing, a pipe, a rattle, these designs and tell stories. Again, Library of Congress, Congress image 1918. It's a photograph, full-blooded Chippewa Indian, folding portrait of a standing Ojibwe man holding a rifle. And I use this image because it's so, his, his clothing is so ornate, it's so detailed. He has this, this, this really beautiful um, beadwork uh, with his you know, breech cloth and his, his shirt and he has an Ojibwe style headdress, again, very different than the Western tribes. So I've seen you know, these older images like this um, of these guys dressed up and they're being, they're in ceremony. There's different ceremonies they would wear these specific clothes to, again, clothing. Um, so you see something like this in your collection, uh, to me, that would be okay. Very high possibility that this was used in a ceremony, during a ceremony. Uh, I need to consult with the specific tribe. It goes on my summary list. So connecting with tribes um, is very important, of course, for, for consultation and putting these together. Institutional records, if the museum or agency has records stating which tribe the items originally come from, these are foundational. This, this is way ahead of the game. If you have, okay, Ottawa, Arapaho, Seminole, that, that's great. And you contact those tribes immediately about these items that you have. Such records can include, but not limit to field reports, articles, archeological reports, notes, papers, ledgers, museum accession, inventory records, donation, gift records, Exhibit catalogs, publications, books, articles, anything and anything. If you can start to, you know, put a name of a tribe with an item, that's that's a huge step. So connect with tribes, uh, provenience. Like through all of the natural process, provenience is one of the key pieces of information. 
whether it's remains, sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony, provenience, provenience, provenience. Knowing where items originate is extremely helpful. The more detailed the provenience, the higher likelihood of placing items with the appropriate tribe. If a specific town or village cannot be determined, figure out your state. That's, that's very important. But if you don't have that, you can go by region. So some items are labeled as Plains, Rocky Mountain, Southwest, Northwest Coast, Great Lakes. Uh, still, that's better than having no provenience whatsoever. All information pertaining to provenience should be listed on a summary. The more information can be gathered as to where the items or items originate from will help directly um, translate into affiliation. More connecting on tribes, details on the items help to narrow down which tribe might be related to the item. In many instances, again, we talked about the patterns, material designs, will tell the stories, will point you in the right direction. Providing as much information in that in your summary is very important. And written sources pertaining to tribes can be helpful sources for helping determine that, such as reputable books, articles and reports on anthropology, ethnohistory, tribes history, and publications on Native American art and exhibits. So I started to use this quite a bit more. Um, the, the last one, Native American art and um, exhibits, there's been a large number of publications on, on Native American art. And I you know, strongly urge to any museum or, or federal agency that's starting to put their summaries, collections together to have a, you know, a collection of these books because they're usually very detailed on what they're showing you, you know, what tribe, you know, what, what era, so on and so forth. So they become, I think, a really good source of information for somebody who is just starting out and, and doesn't have a, you know, a strong knowledge base on Native American tribes is these, these art books. Again, burial practices vary from tribe to tribe. Some tribes buried their dead in caves, some on scaffolds above the ground, many were interred within, within the ground. Uh, these differences lead to many types of unassociated funerary objects. Uh, some use rocks, metals, fauna remains with the dead, and you consult. And if you have a large collection of these types of items, you know, I really strongly need to reevaluate, you know, the potential of these items. It's because it's all these otter bones and bear bones and fish bones. They, these could be part of a death ritual. And you have all these pieces of wood. It could have been part of a burial scaffold. We, we, we've got to determine this through consultation. And the Federal Register for Summaries is uh, notices of intent to repatriate. So uh, on the National NAGPRA website, they have all the templates um, for the NIRs. And this is the link to go to to you know, get those templates when you get to that stage of returning um, summary objects. And again, I want to say miigwech and thank you in my native language of being with us today and I hope you found this training helpful.